This is a sixth grade math lesson over our chapter one practice test. If you take a look, um, you are expected to show all of your work and our copy didn't show up very well. So I often will say to students, SYW, show your work. We're only working on numbers one through 11 for part one of the assignment today. And this is due in the next block that I see students. So if you take a look, the first section, um, these bold print words are really an indicator that we have directions happening. This will also happen on the actual test. The bold print is pretty critical. It tells you what you're expected to do. It says, draw a number line to represent each set of numbers. Well, number one, a vertical number line to represent the following mixed numbers between four and five. Well, let's grab some important pieces. First, I hear it says vertical and it's a number line again. So I know my number line has to go up and down. I'll try that over here where I know I have a little more space. Next it says, I'm looking to find the mixed numbers between four and five. Well, this is pretty important, between four and five. Well, if you remember on our number line, the smaller numbers always go towards the bottom. Sometimes I have students think about how tall they were when they were four and how much they grew when they were five. Well, the smaller numbers are definitely lower on the number line. And we want this to go all the way up to five. Mm, I could probably mark that now. It might be a little bit dangerous because I'm working in marker and might be a little bit safer if we were working in pencil and I have to make some changes in a minute, but we'll give it a try. Next, it says, I have four and three fourths, four and one fifth, four and three tenths, four and one half. I notice something immediately. Those denominators just don't match. It would be really helpful if I could find a common denominator for 4, 5, 10, and 2. So maybe I take a quick minute and I think of my multiples. I'm really trying to find the LCM of all four of these numbers. Well, let's try counting by fours for a quick minute. So I'll try to turn us here a little bit so that you can follow with me. 4 times 1, 4 times 2, 4 times 3. We'll keep on going for a little ways. These again would continue for a really long time, forever and always if I wanted to, but hopefully I have something in here that will work. Let's try counting by fives next. Five times one is five, five times two is 10, five times three is 15, five times four is 20. Well, I see a match right here. I'm kind of hopeful that this might work for the other numbers. If not, I might have to come back and continue my skip counting. Let's try counting by tens. 10 times one is 10. 10 times two is 20. Well, this is looking too good to be true. If you notice, I have a 20 in this list, this list, and this list so far. Let's hope it works for twos as well. Well, counting by twos, we could say two, four, six, eight, ten. I notice there's a 10 on all three of these lists, but I cannot get to 10 counting by fours. So we'll keep going. 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, oh, Thank goodness, 20 works. What does that mean I can do? I can turn each of these denominators into 20ths. So let's give that a try. I'm gonna use a rewrite step over here. I'm gonna take the four and three fourths and figure out how to make it some number of 20ths. Well, that whole number really should stay the same. And I'm saying I need to move from fourths to 20ths. I'll use some multiplication. What do I multiply by? The answer is five. Four times five is 20. If you use this rule in the denominator, you use the same in the numerator. And 3 times 5 is 15. 4 and 15 twentieths needs to go on my number line in a minute. Let's take another fraction that we were given. 4 and 1 fifth. Again, we want to turn this into twentieths. And that whole number really should not change. I'm just trying to change the fractional piece of this problem. So let's give that a try. How do you go from fifths to twentieths? The answer is times 4. If you do that to the denominator, we should do the same to the numerator, and one times four gets us four twentieths with our whole number of four still there. In a minute, I have two fractions ready to go on my number line. Let's look at another, four and three tenths. Remember, we're trying to get a common denominator for all of these, and we found twentieths will work. Well, what did I use to go from 10 to 20? If you're not sure, 
you can go up to your multiple list and count how many times you multiplied. Well, this would be 10 times 1. This is 10 times 2. It's the second one over, so times 2 was my rule. Use the same rule in your numerator, and 3 times 2 is actually 6. What am I missing here? Oh, that's right. The whole number should not change. This is 4 and 6 twentieths. The last fraction we're given is 4 and 1 half, and if you take a look, we want to turn it into some number of twentieths. That whole number should still be here, and I'm just changing the fractional piece with multiplication. What can I use to multiply by 2 to get to 20? Well, if you're not sure, come up and do some counting. This is 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There it is. 2 times 10 was 20. If I use that in the denominator as a rule, we use the same thing in the numerator as our rule. 1 times 10 is 10, of course. Look at all these denominators. They now all match, and they also tell me something. This denominator of 20 means I need 20 equal parts, or sometimes we call them intervals on my number line. So 20 equal parts. Well, if I split this in half first, I know that I need 10 between the first half and 10 between the next half. Uh, let's see here. How could I make that work? What if I started with maybe five parts in each? So I kind of start with a middle section and then chop those other two ends in half or in other in smaller parts. I'll try the same thing between this halfway mark and five. I'll try to split it into five sections first. So I kind of find that middle section if I can and take what's left and split it again and what's left on the other side and split it again. Hopefully if this worked well, I think I'll have 10 parts at this point. We count our jumps or our parts. So we'll start at four and jump one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Looks pretty good. We want these intervals to be equal. And I can see I got a little bit crowded near the top, but it's not too bad. So I'm going to let it go. Well, I don't want 10 parts. I want 20. Well, that sounds like twice as many. So if I chop these in half, I'll go from tenths to twentieths. So if you notice, right in the middle of each of those previous intervals, I'm chopping them in half. We really should be ready to start. Well, let's see. The first fraction I'm given, or mixed number I should say, is 4 and 15 twentieths. Well, I could start counting my twentieths for sure. But I know something. 5 is the same as 4 and 20 twentieths. That's another name for 5. And 15 twentieths is pretty close to that. I could count backwards. This would be 4 and 19 twentieths, 4 and 18 twentieths, 4 and 17 twentieths, 4 and 16 twentieths, 4 and 15 twentieths. Not only do we need a point here, we need to give him his identity, his name. And remember, that wasn't his original fraction name. That was what we turned him into a minute ago to try to find common denominators. So his original name would be 4 and 3 fourths. We probably want to show both on our number line. The next fraction that we were given was 4 and 1 fifth, but we changed it using common denominators to find 4 and 4 twentieths. So 4 twentieths is closer to the bottom of this number line. It's closer to 4. So let's start at the bottom and count 4, 4 and 1 twentieth, 4 and 2 twentieths, 4 and 3 twentieths, 4 and 4 twentieths. Not only do we need to make sure a point is on that location, we need to give him I, his identity, 4 and 4 twentieths. Or remember his original name was 4 and 1 fifth. I joke with students, 4 and 4 twentieths might be his name by day, but what's his name at night? Kind of like superheroes, of course. Take a look at this next one. 4 and 3 tenths wasn't very helpful because it didn't have common denominators with the other fractions. So we turned it into 4 and 6 twentieths. Well, I know that I had 4 and 4 twentieths just a minute ago. It seems like if I had two more twentieths, I'd have 4 and 6 twentieths. So I could start here and count 4 and 5 twentieths, 4 and 6 twentieths. Make sure you have a point on that location. Let's give him his name or his identity by day. But don't forget his identity by night. 4 and 3 tenths. There's one more fraction to be included, 4 and 1 half. And I really could find the halfway mark between 4 and 5. But because we already turned it into 20th, let's see if we can make it work that way. 
10 20ths is more than 6 20ths. So if I start at 6 20ths and move up, I should be able to get there pretty quickly. After 4 and 6 20ths, I'd say 4 and 7 20ths, 4 and 8 20ths, 4 and 9 20ths, 4 and 10 20ths. Make sure you give us a good point on that location. Give us his name by day, but don't forget his name by night. If you notice, a good check for yourself is to look back and see how many mixed numbers you were given. Actually, there were one, two, three, four mixed numbers. Four mixed numbers means I should have four points on my number line. Let's see if we do. One, two, three, four. I absolutely do. And if you notice, all four of those mixed numbers had to be made into common denominators. All four of them changed. So all of them should have two names or two identities. And if you look back at our number line, they do. Let's look at number two next. Well, this is different because it says this time I'm trying to make a horizontal number line. And I want to represent decimals between five and six. Well, if you remember, horizontal means from left to right. It's kind of like looking at the horizon of the sun setting or rising. So I'm going to try to make my number line and it says to start at five. It says to go to six. But now if I look at these place values, I notice something. Most of them end in the tenths place. This one doesn't. This lands in the hundredths. That could be tricky in a minute. I think I'm going to use what I know about the tenths place. If I needed a tenths place, it's like taking my number line and split it into ten equal parts. Hmm. Another way I could think of this is think of money. Well, I've shown students to change five and two tenths into five and twenty hundredths. It really has the same value, but now it lands in the hundredths place. Well, this next one already looks like money, doesn't it? Just has some extra change in the hundredths place. Take a look at this five and six tenths. We could put a zero at the back and make it five and sixty hundredths. That kind of looks like money to me, almost like five dollars and sixty cents. If we continue this strategy, all of these will resemble money. Well, I know if I'm counting by nice tens to get to 100, or in this case, maybe like dimes, counting to get to one dollar, it's going to take 10 dimes, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100, or another whole dollar. And that means I'm splitting this number line into 10 equal parts. Well, I'm going to find the halfway mark. That means I need five to the left and five to the right. Again, when I usually start this, I try to find kind of a middle section, split the section to its left, split the section to its right. On the upper half of my number line, I find the middle section, split the lower half again and the upper half again. Ideally, I'll have 10 parts. Let's check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Notice I'm counting how many jumps or how many intervals we have here. The gaps in between are those intervals, not the lines. Be careful. Well, this five might be written as money, five dollars and zero cents. This six could be written like money, six and zero hundredths. This might help me if I'm counting by ten cents every time or ten hundredths every time. This first stop would be five and ten hundredths. This next stop would be five and twenty hundredths. That's actually what I'm looking for. This decimal says five and twenty hundredths or his other name might be five and two tenths. I'm gonna skip over this tricky one again, this five and 45 hundredths, because again, he has something in that hundredths place that makes it a little bit tricky to count by dimes. Let's look at something different. Let's look at this five and 60 hundredths. Well, five and 10 hundredths, 20 hundredths, 30 hundredths, 40 hundredths, 50 hundredths, 60 hundredths. This would be five and 60 hundredths, kind of like five dollars and 60 cents. If you're thinking about money, he has another name. Five and six tenths really means the same thing. Good. I might circle that or check it off somehow. We're done. What about this? Five and ten hundredths. Oh, we remember that from a while ago. We keep jumping across him, don't we? We had five and zero hundredths. And if I gave you ten cents, you'd have five dollars and ten cents. Or five and ten hundredths. Another name for this decimal is five and one tenth. How about this? Five and ninety hundredths is very, very close to six whole dollars, isn't it? It's kind of like taking ten cents away from you. 
So if I started at the six, I could really count backwards. I could count backwards by 10 cents. Oh, or backwards by 10 hundredths. This spot here would be five and 90 hundredths, also known as five and nine tenths. Well, remember, if we have one, two, three, four, five decimals, we should have one, two, three, four, uh-oh, five points on our number line. We're missing one. Take a look at this. Let's really think about money on this situation. What two numbers would this land between? Hmm. 45 cents would really be between 40 cents and 50 cents on my number line. Let's see if we can find those. Five dollars, five dollars ten cents, five dollars twenty cents, five dollars thirty cents. Oh, here's five dollars and forty cents. It doesn't need a point. And here's five dollars and fifty cents. It doesn't really need a point. It's just giving me a reference. Well, halfway between 40 cents and 50 cents is 45 cents. I could draw a halfway mark here with kind of a tick mark, but I'm also gonna make sure he gets a point. I'm gonna identify this as five and 45 hundredths, or five dollars and 45 cents if you're thinking about money. If you notice, we have one, two, three, four, five decimals represented with one, two, three, four, five points. And those points are critical on your test. If you don't show them, you can't get full credit. Let's take a look at number three and four. If you remember early in our unit, we kind of fought with these ideas. We were having some trouble maybe comparing some fractions and decimals. I definitely hope since we're approaching the test that it's getting better. Well, take a look at this first one. Looks like this one's written to the hundredths place in decimal form. And the second one's written to the hundredths place in decimal form. Well, that's good. They both end in the same place value. Let's do some comparing. But if they're written to the hundredths place, first I might remind myself, this kind of looks like money. Would it be more to have $3.06 or compared to $3.60? Or would it be less to have $3.06 compared to $3.60? Hopefully you would notice that using this idea of money, $3.60 would be worth more. We need to use a less than symbol. There's another way to think of this. Some of my students will cross off the whole number if it matches. And then they'll say, hey, look here in the tenths place. This is who decides. This digit in the tenths place is different. Is zero tenths greater than or less than six tenths? The answer would still be less than. We're ready for number four. If you take a look, um, it says that we could use a number line to help us. We didn't really use that a whole lot um, in our unit because I found that sometimes they gave us some that were so close together it was really hard to compare. So um, it might be too close to call if we're not exact with our number lines. So for that reason, you may want to do a rewrite step here. And we have learned how to take a decimal and write it as a mixed number. Be careful, this is not 5 sevenths. Lots of students like to say that, but it's not. It has five in the whole number, or five ones, and seven tenths. Oh, I just read it, five and seven tenths. That's exactly what I should write. Well, if I compare these now, I have a little bit of a problem. Look at my denominators. They just don't match. I need to find a common denominator for both of these numbers. I, again, could count by tens. I could count by fours. I could see if I could find a common denominator. Hey, didn't I do that earlier? Didn't we count by tens and fours? This is actually good test taking. If you notice something that's familiar on your test, look back and see if there's a tool to help you. Well, right here were my fours. Right here were my tens. Well, they definitely shared 20, but did they share anything smaller? Is there a least common multiple that I missed just between those two numbers? No, nope, looks like 20 is it. I know that I can turn both of these into 20ths. Remember this whole number needs to stay the same. Nothing's changed with it. I'm really just chopping its little pieces into smaller parts. So how did I go from tenths to 20ths? Oh, that was times two. So what is seven times two in the numerator? 14. 5 and 14 twentieths. Take a look at this next one. How did we go from fourths to twentieths? Well, we multiplied by 5. If we use times 5 in the denominator, we use the same rule in the numerator. Well, 3 times 5 is 5, 10, 15. 5 and 15 twentieths. Oh, hopefully I kept everything lined up here, meaning this original problem had a left side and a right side, and I've kind of tried to continue that. I went a little bit out of alignment, but it's pretty darn close, right? So I could rewrite this. 5 and 14 twentieths 
compared to 5 and 15 twentieths. My students have learned that they can kind of cross off the things that are the same, so whole numbers, they match. That won't really decide who wins here. Denominators, finally they're the same. But now you have 14 parts out of 20, or 15 parts out of 20. Would 14 be less than or greater than 15? The answer would be less than. And if you've kept this alignment the whole way through, meaning the decimal that started on the left has all of his work on the left, and the fraction or mixed number that started on the right has all of his work on the right, in that case, this inequality symbol will still be the same in the original problem. 5 and 7 tenths is less than 5 and 3 fourths. Some of you might be thinking money right now. If you know what 3 fourths of a dollar is, you would say that's 75 cents. So for that reason, if you want to think money on this one, you'd show me a rewrite step. You'd show me this is like 5.75 or 5 and 75 hundredths. Then you might need a little zero back here to show that this is 5 and 70 hundredths. It would still be true with that same inequality symbol. Just another way of thinking of it. Let's turn the page and see what we have next. At the top, they ask us to write each number as a product of its prime factors. Oh, a couple clues here. They say, write a product. That means the answer to a multiplication. And they're asking me to find my prime factors. Huh. I know that when I find factorizations, I can use factor trees or ladders. That's going to be our strategy next. Let's go ahead and take this 70 and try it first on a tree. So 70 is the same as, well, 7 times 10 will work. 7 is prime, so we circle it, and 10 is the same as 2 times 5. And if you remember, 2s and 5s are still both prime. Well, how do I show this as the product of its prime factors? Remember, with all good trees, we chop them down, or at least we line them up. So let's put them in some sort of an order. I usually go least to greatest. What is the smallest prime number we found? The answer would be 2. Who comes next? 5. And what's last? 7. Because this is a factorization, I tell you to use multiplication. And another clue is it says product. So we know we need to show multiplication here. This is what they're looking for, final answer. We could try the same idea but using a ladder. Just remember in your ladders you have to use a prime number over here so for that reason some students don't like them quite as well. So what's prime that goes into 70? Oh 2 is prime. 2 goes into 70 35 times so it's kind of like upside down division right? Kind of looks like long division but moving downwards. Let's try again. 35 can be broken down because it's composite so I draw another rung of my ladder and I say well 5 is prime. 5 goes into 35 7 times. Well, if you take a look here, 7 is prime, 5 is prime, 2 is prime, I've ended with only prime factors. This would still be the prime factorization. And again, if you would put it in an organized way, you would write 2 times 5 times 7. I get the same result, just in a different format. Oh my goodness, then they give us a big number, like 540. We have to try the same strategy. A tree will work. Well, I notice it ends in 0. Oh, thank goodness, I know my tens. Whenever I multiply something by 10, it'll put a zero at the back of the number. Well, 10 times 54 would get me 540. 10 is not prime. I need to break it down into 2 times 5. And those two numbers are prime. 54, it's composite. Let's break it down. You could look at your multiplication chart during the test or right now if you need some help. But hopefully you recognize 6 times 9 is a familiar fact and will work. Problem, 6 is composite, needs to be broken down, and 9 in a minute, it's composite too. We have a few more factors to find. 6 is the same as 2 times 3. Those are prime. Oh, finally. And 9 is the same as 3 times 3. Good, more prime factors. If you notice, all of our branches are done. Sometimes I say every branch has a leaf. That's when you know that you're done. Well, let's go ahead and write that as a prime factorization or as the product of its prime factors. So we want to put it in order and there's an awful lot to keep track of, so I'm going to kind of cross them off as we go. So I notice we have a couple of twos, two of them. So I'm going to cross them off over here, two and two. Well then I have a few threes, three of them. Let's put those in order, three, three, and three. And again, on your tree, moving back a quick minute, cross off those factors you've recorded. Be careful, there's one more prime factor here. It's a 5. 
so it needs to go in your factorization or product of the prime factors. Remember, product means multiplication. So whether you use a dot or an asterisk, either way you can show me multiplication. This is a great answer. This is good. Now some of you know how to use exponential form. We're getting pretty good at that around here. So how many twos do you see? The answer is two. So my base is the two that we see, but it happened twice. So we write two to the second power. Look at all these repeating threes. There's a shortcut for writing that, a nice notation in math. Well, the three is my base. It's the number I want to repeat. But how many times does it show up? Three times. So we write three cubed or three to the third power. Well, that five doesn't repeat. We could write five to the first, but we could also just write five. Usually we don't show that notation of to the first power if it's by itself. Well, what happens between all of these? Still multiplication. This is just a shorthand. Both of these answers would be full credit on the test. We did not look at a ladder for 540. It really works the same way. So I think I have a little bit of space to try that with you real quick, just in case you're curious. 540. Well, we have to choose prime numbers. That is the trick. I'm running out of room here a little bit. Well, I know it's even. 2 is prime and goes into it somehow. Well, half of 500 is 250, and half of 40 is 20. 250 and 20. Sounds like 270 to me. And you could use long division to get there as well. Notice we can divide again. Looks like this is still even, ends in a zero. And uh, I know that 2 is prime. Well, half of 200 is 100, and half of 70 is 35. Looks like I'm going to get 135 here. Uh, still composite. Let's keep breaking this down. And if you notice, this ladder might have several rungs because there are more factors to look for. It ends in a 5 now. That's definitely not even, but it divides by 5, which is prime. Well, 5 goes into 120 times, 5 goes into 35 7 times, so let's see, 5 into 120 times, and 5 into 35 7 times. It looks like 27 will work. All right, well 27 looks kind of like it could be prime, but be careful, check your multiplication charts, it's not. We can actually divide by 3, 3 is prime, 3 goes into 27 9 times because 3 times 9 is 27. And there's that 9 that we keep breaking down on our trees, which means it's composite in our ladder also. We could use 3, and 3 goes into 9 three times. If you take a look at the L for our ladder, well, I ended up with still two factors of 2, three factors of 3, and one factor of 5. The same result, and you'll just want to order that in an organized way to show the product of its prime factors. This next section says solve and show your work, but remember, you need to show your work on any problem you do for me, because showing your work can sometimes get you partial credit. I can see if you're heading in the right direction, and then if you make a small error, maybe you won't get full points, but at least you can get yourself um, kind of something on that test, which is what we'd like to see. So always, always, always take a risk. Look what it says here. Write 28 plus 60 as the product of their greatest common factor and another sum. There's that word product again. That means multiplication, doesn't it? And then it says greatest common factor. Oh, we call that the GCF around here sometimes. And then it says another sum. Well, there's going to be addition involved. If you remember back and if you look in your notes, this is talking about a factored expression. So I sometimes say this is really wordy for saying find me the factored form. And if you remember, it looks kind of like this format where we put the GCF on the outside and the extra factors from each of those terms on the inside. Well, this number is kind of big. We've worked with blocks in the classroom where we'd have 28 of one color, 60 of another. We might say we have 28 flowers and 60 butterflies, and we're trying to figure out an equal number to split them into in each of their terrariums or whatever we have going. So to do this, I really need to take 28 and 60 and find their GCF. One way of doing that is some very careful t-charts. Another way of doing that is some very careful factor trees. So well, let's try the tree method right here. 28 is the same as 4 times 7. 7 is prime, but 4 can be broken down into 2 times 2. How about 60? Well, that looks like 6 times 10 to me, and 6 is composite, so we need to break it down into its prime factors of 3 and 2. 3 times 2 will get me 6. 10 is the same as 2 times 5, so we'll show that here. 
Well, with all good trees, I tell you, we need to chop them down. Okay, that sounds harsh. What I really mean is let's line them up. Notice I'm showing multiplication in between these factors because this is a prime factorization. You know, it took multiplication um, between these factors to get back to 60 or back to 28. Well, how would I find the greatest common factor here? If you look, I'd start looking for some pairs. I see a pair of twos. I see another pair of twos. Looks like that's about all they share. So for each pair, I can record them only one time. There's one pair of twos and a second pair of twos. And notice this multiplication I've been using all the way through and the hint from the problem says use a product. Well, I'm gonna to multiply to get there as well. What is two times two? The answer is four. That means four is the biggest number that divides into both of these. Four is the biggest number that divides nicely into 28 and into 60. Well, secretly you could be thinking to yourself, well, how many times does four go into 28? And the answer would be seven. And you could secretly be saying, well, how many times does four go into 60? And with some long division, you might be able to find that. And if you're not real sure, you could also find it another way. Do you see how the seven was an extra from 28's factorization? Oh good, took care of that. But this 60 has two extra factors, three times five. Too bad I can't combine them into one nice number, or can I? Do I know what three times five is? Oh, actually it's 15. And you know what? 15 times four actually gets me 60. It sounds like this is all checking out pretty well. So what you do is you find your extra factors from your factorization, and if there's more than one in the row, then you just multiply them until you find one nice product to record for leftovers. Well, look at this. I can get four baskets, and in each basket, I get seven flowers and 15 butterflies. Or we're making four exhibits with seven flowers and 15 butterflies in each. That's really what they're looking for here, factored form. Sometimes it's helpful just to think of it kind of as a story problem. I think it makes more sense if we're talking about some context. Well, now we need the greatest common factor of three bigger numbers. And if you remember, I could definitely do t-charts, but sometimes they go wrong. Sometimes they're difficult to find all the factors of a number I'm not familiar with. So we're gonna try the factor tree method. The greatest common factor can definitely come from a factor tree. So here we are in number eight. My pen was just kind of soaking through, so we're going to try it this way. 210 needs to be broken down. So does 84, and so does 56. Let's see what we can find here. Well, 10 times 21 will work, and 10 can be broken down into 2 times 5. 21 is the same as 3 times 7. That tree's done. 84, well, it looks like it's even. Half of 80 is 40, and half of 4 is 2. 42. 2 is prime, but 42 is composite. Well, I know 6 times 7 will work, and 7 is prime, 6 is composite. 3 times 2 will get us there. 56, well, that's the same as 7 times 8, right? And 7 is prime, 8, not so much. So break it down again. 2 times 4 is good, but 2 is the only prime number, so 4 must be broken down again. 2 times 2 will work, and both of those numbers are prime. With all good trees, you must chop them down. Okay, that sounds terrible, but we do need to remember to line them up. So over here, I'm going to try to make sure that I have a nice organization for both of these. 210 is the same as 2 times 3 times 5 times 7. And notice I'm chop, not chopping them off. I'm crossing them off as I go. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Oh, I see a 2 hiding up here. 2 and 2 times 2, and I see a 3, and I see a 7. Hmm. Have all the prime factors of 84. And if you check this out, if you tried to multiply them together, you'd actually get back to 84. It works. Well, for 56, I see 1, 2, 3, 2s. 1, 2, 3, 2s. Show some multiplication there. But there's one more factor hiding on that tree. It's a 7. Well, I'm looking for a greatest common factor. I'm looking for a number that all three of them share. Looks to me like they all share a two. There's a triplet right there. Mm -hmm. I see some threes, but only in two of the numbers. I see some twos, but only in two of the numbers. Only five in one of the numbers, but look at these sevens. Oh, another triplet, another match. 
So to find the greatest common factor, you would write 2, because there's a bundle of 2's, times 7, because there's a bundle of 7's. What is 2 times 7? The answer is 14. The greatest common factor for this problem is 14. I just want to show you that we kind of had to build a forest here. We had to make three trees, didn't we? But if you like ladder method, it's pretty amazing because you only need to make one ladder. Think of a prime number that goes into all three. The answer would be two. I see they're all even. Well, if I find halves of each of these, 105 is half of 210, 42 is half of 84, and this one's a little trickier, but 28 is half of 56. Take a look at these numbers now. I need to think of something that goes into all of them, and it might take some looking on a big multiplication chart to find it. I happen to know that they all divide by 7. Well, 7 goes into 105. I might have to do some long division to get there, or sometimes I use something called number bonds. 105, I'm just thinking off to the side here, that's the same as 70 plus 35, right? Oh yeah, and 70 divides nicely by 7, just like 35 divides nicely by 7. 7 goes into 70 10 times, and 7 goes into 35 5 times. Oh, 10 and 5 is 15. And again, long division will find that for you, or maybe a nice big multiplication chart. 7 goes into 42 6 times, and 7 goes into 28 4 times. Is there anything else that 15, 6, and 4 all share that's prime? Well, 15 and 6 have some common factors, and 6 and 4 have some common factors, but the three of them don't share anything more. So for this reason, I could really say that my ladder is done. Well, what's left on the left side becomes my greatest common factor. I just need to use some multiplication. Well, guess what? 2 times 7 is still 14. Our greatest common factor for this problem is still 14. Number 9, we're looking for the least common multiple of 12 and 42. And you can see we got rid of a third number in here. We're trying to make this very doable, just like something you're going to see on the test. So a couple ways to get there. You could count by 12s. You could count by 42. And that might take you a little while, but you'd get there. Another way to approach this is to try some trees. Or a ladder. But let's try the tree approach first. 12 is the same as 3 times 4. 3 is prime, 4 is not. 42, hmm, that's 6 times 7, right? 7's prime and 6 could be broken down into 3 times 2. With all good trees, okay, line them up. We'll put them next to each other here. 2 times 2 times 3. Make sure you have all your prime factors. And 42 is the same as 2 times 3 times 7. Notice I'm trying to put them in order. Looks like I have them all. Well, what is the greatest common factor? I always start with GCF when I line up my trees or my factorizations. They both have 2's and they both have 3's. The greatest common factor would be those two pairs multiplied, meaning 2 times 3 gets me 6. Too bad we don't want the greatest common factor. I want to know what it's going to take to find the least common multiple or the first multiple they would share. So if you remember, we take the greatest common factor times any extra factors. Oh, the GCF was 6. And the extras, well, I didn't circle a 2 and I didn't circle a 7. This is kind of like how we work with our factored expressions, isn't it? Except instead of multiplying everything in our factored expression, we use some parentheses and some addition. But this is what we use for LCM. We multiply all of these factors that are remaining with the GCF. Well, let's see how I could work this out here. 6 times 2 I know is 12 times 7. And if you know your facts, or if you look at your multiplication chart, or even stack these up, 12 times 7, or say 7 times 10 is 70, 7 times 2 is 14 more, looks like we're going to get 84. The LCM of these two numbers is 84. Again, I had to build two trees. Wouldn't it be faster to make one ladder? Let's try it. A prime number that goes into both is 2. 2 goes into 12 6 times, and 2 goes into 42 21 times. Yep, that's right. 21 times 2 is 42. Well, what do 6 and 21 both share? Mm, the answer might be 3. 3 is a prime number that goes into both. 3 goes into 6 twice. 3 goes into 21 7 times. Well, 2 and 7 are actually prime. There's nothing more that they share. So to find the LCM, we take the greatest common factor, which came from the left, and everything in the L, which are the leftovers, and we multiply. 2 times 2 times 3 times 7. What's 2 times 2? 4. It's 3 times 7? 21. 4 times 21. 
Oh my goodness, we actually got the same great result. 84 is your LCM, least common multiple. And again, I know a lot of students love these multiple lists. It's just, I don't know my factors, or I'm sorry, I said the wrong word. My multiples of 42. Sometimes it's easier to break it down into factors for that reason. There was one more due for tonight. Number 11. It says solve, show your work. Well, of course we're going to show our work. We want to get partial credit whenever we can, right? And full credit is even better. So any one number between 18 and 36, which has a factor of 7. It has 7 as a factor. That means that it could be divided by 7. Just trying to put this in words that I understand. And then it says I want a number between, a number between 18 and 36. Well, let's think of some numbers in between. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, whoops, that's not a 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. I won't put 36 on this list. I'll stop here at 35 because I want it to be between 18 and 36. I can't equal either one of them. It could be somewhere in between. Well, there's no way these are all the answers because these don't all divide by 7. So let's do some checking. Does 19 divide by 7? Yeah, the answer would be no. Does 20 divide by 7? No, that doesn't divide by 7 either. Does 21 divide by 7? Oh, the answer is yes. 7 goes in there three times, doesn't it? That actually means that 21 seems to have 7 as a factor. 21 would work. Another way to check this out would be to make some t-charts. So we already know 21 is good. Let's see if we can try it for 22. 22, make a quick t-chart. Well, 1 times 22 is good and 2 times 11, but there's no 7 on this t-chart or this list. 22 is no good. Let's try it with, hmm, 25 sounds fun. So we should probably cross off 22, it didn't work. 25, that's 1 times 25, or 5 times 5. Ugh, no 7 on this list either. Goodbye 25. Can you think of another number in this list that we should try with a t-chart? Something else that might divide by 7? Or could you even count by 7s using your multiples and see if we can find one of these numbers? Well, hopefully you know that maybe 28 is the next contestant. We'll give it a try. 1 times 28, 2 times 14, 3 won't work, but 4 times 7 will work. Hey, weren't we trying to find a factor of 7? There it is. 28 is another good possibility. 21 is good. 28 is good. Do you notice that I'm counting by 7s? Is anything else good in this list that we count by 7s to get to? The answer is, yep, 28 plus 7 gets us 35. There are three possibilities. You really could answer 21, 28, or 35 have a factor of 7. That's supposed to be an O. Use your imagination. Okay, that's true. But really, you're only required to give me one of these. So if you're able to find one of them and show me the proof, either you're testing each one, dividing by 7, and seeing if it will work, crossing it off. If it doesn't, you could say, nope. Nope. Oh, there's one. Yes. Okay, or trying this T-chart strategy would absolutely work as well three possibilities. We also didn't talk about, I, I think I talked about it, but I didn't show it, counting by sevens. So oops, my marker doesn't want to work over here. Seven times one, seven times two, seven times three. Oh, 21. That's on the list. We found a match. Oh, let's keep going. Seven times four. Oh, there's another match. 28 over here and 28 over here. Seven times five. Ah, that's where this is coming from. I also could use a multiple list. There's a couple ways to think of that. Three possibilities, but again, we only needed one today. We're going to pick up where we left off the next time I video for you. And uh, with our next assignment, we'll work, be working on part two to review for our test. So um, good work if you're able to make it this far. Thanks for checking the YouTube videos. If they're helpful to you, let me know so that I can keep making a few more. If again, it's a good tool. If not, doesn't hurt to hear that either because then I know I can stop making them for families.